what would you say if I said if the towel had a brain, pitching coaches wouldn't have a job? Would, would you relate to that? The towel is the best teacher of pitching mechanics that we've run across. And number one and number two, what are the most important things? Balance and <coughs> posture. Because everything else turns to crap if you don't have balance and posture. Now, where's Kevin Craig? All right. He built just like you. What's one of the biggest difficulties you have, even as hard as you work physically? Balance and posture, keeping the heaviest thing on your body over your center of gravity. Mark Pryor didn't put all the pieces together until he had the functional strength to support balance and posture, core strength. And just walking around and talking to Brent, talking to Gary, and talking to Jeff, there's core strength issues across the board. You're a three-quarter guy. For you to get on top of the ball, you got to change your posture. Read my lips. Don't do that. How's that for coaching? You keep your head straight. Your natural slot is three-quarters. Let it happen. Don't let a kid... Don't let a coach arbitrate your arm slot. Why do you think they leave Mark Pryor alone? Why do you think they just leave him alone? Because he's pretty friggin' good. All right, who are they gonna mess with the most, Stumpy? They're gonna mess with the guy that's, that can be messed with. Are you, do you are your parents aware of this? Tom, they're gonna mess with your kid? Oh yeah, they do. Because they can. If your kid's carrying the mail, they just kind of say, okay, I hope he continues to carry the mail. All right. They're not gonna fiddle. And when does opposite and equal start? the second your hands break, because that is giving you balance as you're going down the tightrope that you call your stride. If, we, if we've got balance and posture, gentlemen, the legs are fixed. Some kids are gonna land on their heel. Some kids are gonna land flat foot. Some kids are gonna land on the ball on their foot. When I first was a pitching coach with the Rangers, I wanted everybody to land on the ball on their foot. No one says, I ain't doing it. <laughs> okay, that's fine. No, don't do it. But then we went back and Alan Blitzfly I said, okay, tell me what's going on because I'm teaching something that some of these guys don't want to do. He said, Tom, they all get to the ball with their foot. If they land on their heel, it's no big deal. As long as you get to the ball with your foot. Now we've taken the teach even further. If your head only goes forward, you will get to the ball with your foot. You can't screw it up. You kids, I just heard Brett telling you, why do you want to keep your eyes going toward home plate? What does it help your balance do, Tibor? It keeps your head up. Yeah, it keeps your head up, and it, it gives you the kinesthetic and proprioceptive awareness of where you're going. He was a kid in high school that, you know, he was blessed, and he's a big body kid, 6'5", 230, could throw really hard, but he couldn't consistently throw strikes. He was always up in the strike zone. Curveball had a big hump in it. Scouts loved him because of his body and his arm strength but he really wasn't a dominating high school pitcher. He signed to go to Vanderbilt, went there last year, didn't pitch all that well, decided he wanted to transfer. His uncle is Tim Foley, Tim knew Tom from years ago. Finally, after, you know, he'd heard from a, a bunch of people, including me, for three or four years that he needed to work on his functional fitness, you know, he hit the bottom, decided to ask for help, came to Tom, got on the right functional fitness program, consistently throwing 95, low in the strike zone, nasty curveball, he's going to change Santa Clara's program around this year. The key to the thing is he committed to what he didn't want to do, functional strength. Now, oh, where, when did you finally put all the pieces you had to strength was? Animal, oh, I right? think it's 24, 25. But I think, like with these younger kids, the fact that they have the knowledge now and they know what to do, I think they'll cut that, that down. I and, think they'll cut that time frame down but uh, and have more consistent success earlier. Did you hear what he just said? This information slash instruction, you guys that are really good, we'll probably get to the big leagues. You'll get there sooner because of the quality of information and instruction that you are indeed, you're applying. What's his back shoulder doing there? 45 degrees. The best in the game get close to 90 degrees. Average major league is right around 60 degrees of torque. Get close to that and you'll find out how good you are. Shoulder square enough. <laughs> When the shoulders square up, the glove side arm is going to be 90 degrees to the forearm and elbow, and the throwing arm is going to lay back 90 degrees, forearm to elbow. It's kind of like a Z. Across the board, Randy Johnson does it. When Randy Johnson's arm snaps straight from that position, he comes through this way. Nolan and Mark came through about three quarters, maybe a little bit higher. Guys like Musina, he comes through over the top. His arm lays back at 90 degrees and snaps straight over the top. Perceived velocity. One foot of distance is three miles an hour to the hitter's eyes. Now, if you have perceived velocity 
and real velocity created with torque, then you're an elite pitcher. Why am I so concerned about everybody getting the back parallel to the ground? Because that's what the best in the game do. And we'll see Nolan doing it differently. But Nolan's back gets parallel to the ground. Nolan's glove also at release point is slightly in front of his landing leg foot. It's a teachable thing. Well, I was telling Tom on the, if if I need to really make a pitch low and away, a really good fastball low and away, I knew I had to stay with the ball longer and get out as far as I could. And what it did is I stayed with the ball longer, I had more force behind the ball. And when the ball would leave my fingertips, I knew if it was a pitch I wanted to throw. I knew if it was where it was supposed to be. And I took my head right to where I, I wanted to. So I stayed. What I use, the term I use, I stayed closed as long as I possibly could with my shoulders and get my head out. This is the kind of torque that you have right now. Now, I'm not saying you're going to throw like Nolan did, but see where you're back in, in the Mets uniform right there, where your shoulder goes back? That's torque. Um, that's what we were fiddling with with you. Did his, uh, Kevin, did his glove change position there? Did his glove change position here? What's the only thing that changes position? Now, is that something that's teachable? Yes. So you would really focus your eyes on your target. I mean, pick it up early. I, the, before I ever threw the pitch, I knew where I wanted to throw it. I had envisioned where the ball was going to be. And then when I... Just keep your head there as long as you could? Is that I took my head right to where I'm going to throw the ball. And the only time I ever lost sight of where I was throwing the ball is as I released the ball, if I got way out over my front foot, my head would go down and I'd bring it back up and I'd momentarily lose sight of it. But after release? Right. So all the way through release, you had your I, eyes. I, I'm right there. In there. I'm locked on where I'm throwing the ball. He used to call, and correct me if I'm wrong, riding the ball. He wanted to ride the ball on long flat ground throwing and off the mound. He wanted to ride the ball as long as he could ride it. When we played flat ground or long toss, I wanted to ride the ball. I wanted the ball on that plane, and I wanted that good tight four seam rotation where that ball looked like it was riding, you know, like that. Did you ever cast the ball? No, no you don't want to cast the ball. And what we would do with our long toss, we would keep getting further and further apart until I got to the point that we'd reached the distance that I couldn't continue to do that and I'd start short hopping him, I started moving back in. And I moved in, and there at the end, you know, I was airing it out, and we were, I don't know, maybe 90 feet, and you know, and that's the way I would finish up. And uh, at that distance, you know, it was hard, it was hard you to know, play catch at that distance. what he just said was, when we were playing long toss, and what I had you do is I had you short enough to where you could hit your partner in the chest seven out of 10 times, we would lengthen it out to where he could no longer throw perfectly. And then we'd shorten it up in successive three, four, five throws till he was 65 or 70 feet and playing major giddy up. Flat ground. Long tosses as far as you can throw. Perfect. You have to throw, 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 and throw some more to your level of tolerance with perfect mechanics to build arm endurance. The only place you can build arm strength is with resistance training with the stuff that Sean is showing. So let's see the guys going out and throwing 200 feet. Well, is there any purpose or is that just warm up? No, that, you know what that is, it's, and this is my opinion, is that's lack of knowledge. I watched Freddie Garcia before the game they, go out you know, there and he'll get a guy out in the deep right field. We used to use football and I, I used football to warm up prior to going out on the field. and. And Tom will tell you this, one of the problems we had with football was we could get 30 feet apart and accomplish what we needed with the football, but we would have trouble with the guys going out there and won't see how far they could throw it. <laughs> well, let's have a name on the pitch. Let's have Mitch Williams, Bobby Wood. You know, and Jeff they, they would lose focus of why they were, what that drill was all about. And so, you know, it, it, uh, it was counterproductive. I used to, when I played long toss, I would drop the ball on the ground, I would reach down and I'd pick it up, and then I'd, the term I use, I would gather myself, basically, and then throw the throw. And I did that as a conditioning. 
because it made me bend my legs and it was a conditioning tool. I just started doing that because it, it was just something I had to do to, to, to get, but now that I know more about what, why I did that, it, it was because when I said I gathered myself, I got within myself and my balance. As I had my balance so I could throw the ball. When he bent Even down on long pick, toss. When he bent down to pick the baseball up and came up with his step behind, where was his head relative to his belly button? You guys even know what pickups are? Do they do those anymore? Mm -hmm. sure. All right. Pickups. So, so for the purposes of these guys pitching, though, up to 90 or 100 feet is more than adequate to stay perfect mechanics. Right. You don't even balance. have to put a number on it. Long yeah. toss is as with far as you can throw perfect. Is and not then at that distance, one hop a few of them, then close it up where you know you can hit your partner. Right. And what he used to call riding. And that's where you, the arm speed side of the equation, when you're chunka, 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 whoa, you know, you've lined up all that energy. Now, let's stay with this just a little bit longer. Where's and let, me, let me say one other thing before we go any further. That was also a stamina drill. And I would throw until I reached that point and I would finish up really hard, but it was also, I used it as a conditioning tool. It gave me that stamina that, that uh, I did, besides just throwing off a flat ground, working on my delivery. Now let me throw something out for planning purposes, boys. Nolan knew that on a given day, it was a long toss day, that he was gonna throw 50 to 100 long tosses. Do you think he did that on my time with other pitchers? Do you think he did it and pulled away from batting practice and whatever, or did, he, did we go out early and do it on Nolan's time? He never really? took advantage of the other nine pitchers on the staff with him. His work, his extra work, was done on Nolan time. Now there's real time and there's Nolan time. He's 6'2", six, six Nolan, mm -hmm. and he had an 81-inch stride. Now, was that genetics? Was it functional strength? Was it flexibility? Um, Nolan was one of the few guys in professional baseball that could do a legitimate splits. And you would come in in between innings and go up and work on the flexibility issue. So where the leg lift comes from too? You know, I, he started lifting the leg higher as he, as I got the older. the Angels. As I got older, I lifted my leg higher. And uh, it just was a field deal because I felt like that I could just and, it, and it, again, I would say I used it gathering myself. I would just get up and it, I just felt like I was in a position that then I, I used the incline of the mound more. But is, was it strength or flexibility that you thought you can get your legs higher? Well, I think it's a combination of both. I think that, uh, Marty, uh, there's no way you, you know, and, and, right. and I don't sit, <laughs> saying, I don't sit here and say everybody needs to have a high leg kick. They need to have what's comfortable to them. It's just like their arm slot whatever com their comfort level is, just like hitters, you know. And how much, as, as your career progressed, how much did your body change and how did we have to keep tweaking? Well, you know, when I signed, I was 6'2 and weighed 150. When I was out of the game, I was 6'2, 212, you know. So uh, uh, there was, during that 27 year period, uh, you know, I was, I was much stronger. Uh, in better condition when I walked out of the game as than when I came in the game. Okay, Tony, I heard you say one time that uh, Mark gets there quicker than most. Yeah, and then, then Nolan did. Explain that. Well, because of Nolan's high leg lift, he took longer to get to front foot contact. Okay. But once he got to front foot contact, he catches up. Remember in the little PowerPoint that we did? Randy Johnson has a certain timing. Roger Clemens has a certain timing. Nolan had a certain timing. At front foot contact, Mark got, got to front foot contact quicker than you did. But after front foot contact, you blew by them like they were standing still. Your acceleration from these pictures to release point, however you did it, caught up in a blink. So you were slower to front foot contact, but into release point, you caught up. Right. Have I made it clear to you kids? I don't care what your offset eagle looks like. I don't care as long as you get 60 to 90 degrees of torque, I don't care how you achieve it or when you achieve it in your delivery. When your shoulders square up, your shoulders are gonna square up somewhere in the vicinity of the ball of your front foot. Your glove will be somewhere in the vicinity of straight up from the ball of your front foot. Some guys get a little further, some guys are a little bit behind. 
all right? But it doesn't, it squares up like a gyroscope thing. And remember the picture of Mark Pryor? You can kind of see it with Nolan here. The Astros shirt is doing what? It's going, from, everything in the man's body has stopped except the forearm on the throwing hand. One of the things that we were talking earlier, when I first came up, you know, they taught you to rock back. Well, as I was saying earlier, the only time, the reason he rocked back is so you can set your foot. That's the only reason. Is he set your foot, and then I would come up, and uh, my, I had checkpoints in my delivery. And the first checkpoint I had was my knee to my shoulder. I had to get there before I did anything. Then I broke and went to the plate. But when my foot hit the ground, that's when it happened. My foot hit the ground, boom, that's when I went. And see what he just did right there? What did he do? Damn it, boys. I mean, did you see you know, something right there? We yeah. had a drill where I always like to have a a ball when I played catch with Tom in this hand because what it did, it forced me to do that. And watch what he's throwing. Pretend you're throwing. Just, it was just like that. Watch his head. Just pretend you're throwing. No, watch this again. When watch the up, It was there. What did his head just do, Joe? And I took my head right to where I'm throwing the ball. And when did it happen for you, Gary? Or I hope you're still in here. I'm here. What, what did he just say in his own words? When did it happen when his front foot hit? He can't throw the ball until that foot hits the ground. Have to, that happy, foot Gary? hits the ground. Yes, that foot hits the ground, you're right there. I think, Tommy, I think a lot, of kids, right there. a lot of kids try and throw at separation. Yeah. Well, well, I, separate I was. Through. See, I grew up throwing as hard as I could, and I didn't know anything about it. And so the first thing you do is when you broke your hands, you were going to throw as hard as you could, and you did that. Look at his Mets picture. And when right you there. did that, and any time when I knew if I was going to throw the ball and I didn't throw it where I wanted it, I knew what I did in my delivery and why I didn't throw it there. If I flew open, the ball was up and away. The left-handers are up and in the right-handers. That told me right then that I was too quick here. Okay. If I yank, if I throw a curveball in the dirt, it's because I abbreviate. I try to get too quick. Now, that here. was a big word. I hate to just use the big word. That was a big word. It's still English. So, it's still uh, and that's the thing with you. You have to learn in its repetition of when you're successful, why you were successful, and how it felt, and when you weren't. And that, and when I say successful, meaning you didn't throw the ball. Where you were meaning to throw the ball. That's that's a difference. That's the difference in being successful, not successful. You hear the term people are wild in the strike zone. Yeah, well I didn't walk anybody, no, but you gave up fifteen hits because you trying to throw low and away and you're throwing right down the middle. And you see that every you see that and all you have to do is turn on a game and the catcher's sitting out there like cat and the ball's up here. The reason the ball's up here is because that guy did something in his delivery. It didn't line to throw the ball down there. No, would you say something about what you mean by abbreviate? Okay. No, no, I know what you mean by abbreviate. Instead I just of mean. staying with the ball, I tried to make something happen and I cut it off. Is what happened. Instead of it staying, staying on my delivery and and letting it all happen like it should and throwing my breaking ball like it should, what I did is I shortened it up and cut cut it off. Try to throw too hard a curveball. Boy, you see people do that all the time. You'll see a guy, man, he is going to snap one off and he doesn't even reach the dirt. He throws it in the grass. And the catcher is going like that. <laughs> you know, that's what he's doing. Do you think, let me ask you, Nolan, do you think your early formative years with the Mets when you lacked the functional strength that you acquired later, had, had you had been a frontline guy with the Mets at age 19, 20, 21, whatever, and it accumulated Brent Saberhagen type innings, 250, 270, Dwight Gooden, 250, 270. Would you have risked the chance of injury at a very formative age right. that those if, guys ended up having? If I wasn't strong uh, and, and logged those kind of innings, you're going to have problems. And that's what that, happened. That, 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 I want to tell you, when they tell you the weakest link, Bill, trust me, the weakest link will show up when you accumulate in. That's That's a given. And I want to tell you, if you ask me, the thing that I did that I felt like 
uh, allowed me to pitch as many innings as I did was my abdominal work. I can't tell you how much of that I did. I did it all the time because I knew that I could. I had that feel. I I didn't know what it was, but I knew that if I wasn't strong in my core, then that's when I started having problems. If that isn't enough to motivate you, boys, I don't know what will. Does it take any talent to work hard in the weight room? No, that's one thing, and I've always said you never want to walk off the field and feel like you got beat because other teams are better shape than you. Because that's a no-no. I mean, that's one thing you control on a personal basis. You know, they might have better talent. They may have gotten the breaks, but they sure should never be in, in better shape than you. And I always conditioned to go 12 minutes. I felt like that. That's your ball game. And if, if you, it requires you to go 12 innings to win a game, then I want to be in shape to do that. Most people aren't going to allow you to do that. But in the old days we did. You know, they talk about one of the greatest games that, that was ever played was when Warren Spahn and Juan Marichal matched up. I think they went 16 innings. Mm -hmm. And the game was ended one to nothing on a home run by Willie Mays. Oh. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We won't live to see that again because the game won't allow it. What was your highest pitch count, if you know? 242. <laughs> and I was on a four-day rotation, and I came back and pitched four days later and didn't do very well. <laughs> <laughs> I, went 12, I went 12 innings and, and uh, won the game through 242 pitches. And we were pitching on four days in those days. That's why Frank Canana. Frank and I were the Angels together when we were pitching on four days, and Frank and Anna blew out because he didn't have the strength. Tommy, can I make one point? I'm sure. sure. It's always intrigued me. <coughs> of 17 guys have been voted into the Hall of Fame, or that have won 300 games in the last 30 years or something like that. The majority of those wins have been after the age of 26, 25 years old, spawned a lot of these guys. And what happened to the Goodens, the Saberhagens, Tananas and these people at very young ages before they had functional strength were deemed prospects and, and, and stars and they pitched 250, 260 innings at very young ages without physical strength and they all broke down and most baseball executives when they see a young Tanana, a young Saberhag and a young Gooden, the first thing they say is, wow, he's awful good, just think how good he's going to be when he has experience. They never get the experience, they end up breaking down and the number of guys that have won 150 games by the age of 30, I think only one guy has won 300 games in the entire career. And they've won 150 by the age of 30. So that shows how important the functional strength is at a young age to be able to withstand this. One thing, one thing about it is every one of y'all that are in here, are in here because you have love baseball and you have a gift. And you were given that gift. You know, Nolan Ryan didn't do anything to be blessed with the arm that he had. It took me a while to figure that out, you know. It took me a while to figure out, hey, this was a God-given gift that I have. And then I decided I was going to be the best player I could be for as long as I possibly could be. And once I made that, realized that and made that decision, and I didn't do it at 18. I was just, hey, I was happy to be playing professional baseball, getting the paid to do what I really enjoyed doing and I thought it was a pretty neat opportunity but then it finally went off my head that hey you know I really have an opportunity here and then I dedicated myself to be the best player I can be and that's what every, each and every one of y'all going to do need to do is dedicate yourself to be the best that you possibly can be and conditioning is one of the biggest aspects of it because I want to tell you something if, if you're not in shape and you can't handle the workload, it's just a matter of time before you start having problems and you break down. And one of the things is, is that it's been easy for each one of y'all to this point in time because you've been blessed with this gift. And so you've always excelled. Well, when the workload comes in, if you're not prepared for the workload, then it's just a matter of time before you break down. So you have to work hard. You have to take that gift and make something out of it if that's what you choose to do. And I feel like that's probably what y'all choose to do because you're here today. 
and then you have an entry. So you have to take the information they give you and apply it. And that doesn't mean that that you do it a couple of days a week. That means you live by it. And I'll, I'll say one thing. I took one of the things I did when the season was over, I took a month off. And the reason I took a month off was for what I call recharging my battery. I did it because I need to get away from that routine and that schedule. And when I found it, towards the end of that month, I started getting itchy to get back into that routine because I missed it. And when I did get back into it, I got back into it with the attitude that I really missed it and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed working out. I felt good about myself after a good workout. And that's what you need to do. How much uh, relationship from that time and energy and sweat and effort and the conditioning carried over to your mental toughness on the mound? That's all part of it. You have, if you don't have the discipline to work out and prepare yourself, you're not going to have the discipline on the mound to win a ball game. Because there's going to be times during that game that it's going to require you not to be distracted. You know, I developed tunnel vision and uh, not to be distracted uh, and let things that affect you affect the game, affect you and your approach. And, and as Tom and I said, I took one pitch at the time. You know, that's the way he played the game, one pitch at the time.